having me today. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Just doing the introduction. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mentoring Mondays. I'm Ana Sofia, and here we have Catherine DeBoer. She's an experienced human resources specialist with a demonstrated history of working in the human resources industry. She's skilled in onboarding, organization skills, customer service, human resources, information system, and coordination of benefits. She majored in psychology and she received her Bachelor of Arts from Central Connecticut State University. Welcome. Thank you. So, may I just ask, are you all students um, gaining your bachelor's right now? Okay. We can introduce ourselves. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm the graduate assistant here, so okay. I'm getting my master's and I'm curious. Okay. I'm Lani, really and I'm going to talk more with my major in media studies. Okay. I'm Marianne Mahoney, and I'm the director. And come on, Colin. Yeah. Uh, and I am not a student. <laughs> I'm Bella. I'm a senior here, and I'm majoring in psychology. I'm Sophia, and I'm I am a good engineering. Okay, a little of everything here. Yeah. And I go back to just. Okay. And I do hope to continue. <laughs> so um, I've worked in human resources now for about 22 years, and I've done a whole variety of jobs within human resources. I've done recruiting, I've done onboarding, I've done the benefits, I've done retirements, I've done a little bit of everything dealing with um, anything that you would do with human resources once you get a job. So luckily for you, the state has their act together and we have one spot now where you can go to apply for jobs. Previously, you used to have to go to like 12 different websites. You still do have to go to those websites, but at least there's one avenue to go to the particular link and then branch out from there, where before you would have to remember all different locations because the state of Connecticut is a very large employer. We have so many agencies, like 40 something agencies on top of the universities that we have, the community colleges where you could work. Um, all the health facilities are fall under the state, UConn Health, um, uh, um, Department of Public Health, D, uh, DMV, DMIS, so there's different, um, health issues within those kind of agencies. So we have a vast majority of jobs available, a wide range from A to Z. So the best place to go is right on the front page, ct.gov. And you'll see the very top thing, the most popular is applying for state jobs. So Amy, the, do you want to take us to that? As Kathy goes along, do you want to follow or take us to this? It's really easy if you want to head to it. We just need to open up a. Um, yeah, I opened up the. And it has always been the most popular number one that everybody is looking for. So you would just click on apply for state jobs. The very first one. And right there, there's a different job openings. You have the executive branch which is um, the branch of government that um, all of the main agencies fall under, the state police, the Department of Correction, the DMV, Department of Public Health, um, uh, DMIS, uh, basically uh, there's 40 different agencies that fall under there that you could apply for jobs in that particular area. Then there's the judicial branch of government, which has the um, the Supreme Court, the Superior Court, your judicial marshals who work there, uh, judges, secretaries, court recording monitors who take the notes in the courts, um, interpreters, if you're a sign language um, interpreter, that is a, a location where you could get a job within the state of Connecticut. So that is the judicial branch if that was somewhere where you were interested in going. The legislative branch is where the governor falls under and all of his of employees 
such as the press secretary, legal aides, legal counsels, um, they all fall under legislative. So if you're interested in politics, that's where your area would go there. And then the fourth area is your state colleges and university jobs. And that lists um, this, what we call the sister universities, Eastern, Western, Southern, and um, oh, who am I missing? Central, us. Yes, yeah, Central, our sister universities, and then all of the community colleges fall under that. Now, UConn is its own entity, even though it is an employer under the state of Connecticut. So they actually have their own website, HR, and it's listed on this packet that I've given you, hrucon.edu/jobs. So if, depending on what your interest is, um, you would click on one of those links and apply for a job. So I'll go over the executive branch, which is um, the main area of the, the state where it has the majority of the 40 agencies. So if you want to click on the executive branch jobs, it's going to bring you to what they call an online employment center. And the first thing you can do is click on the first tab over there, job openings. And you're going to scroll down and there's going to be a very long list of jobs. You're going to see everything that's there. The first ones are open to the public. So if you are not currently a state employee, these are all the jobs that are open for current um, people that are working outside of the state to get into the state. Is it user friendly so that you can do the location? Narrow it down. Yep. So you can see um, there is the location with the codes there. And I believe if you look a little bit up, there's a search button. Go scroll up a, a tad bit, a little bit more. Um, right narrow there, the narrow your job search on the left. Mm -hmm. So if you only wanted a certain agency, I only want to work at Department of Motor Vehicle, I'm, that's the place I want to be. You could put DMV in there and pick your agency and it'll only show you the jobs that are open at DMV at this particular time. Mm -hmm. So, and then I think you might have to hit apply at the bottom, search. And so now all of the DMV jobs will show up for you. So apparently it does not look like DMV has anything open at the moment. So there, uh, the other trick is so you don't have to go to this constantly every day to see what the new jobs are. At the very top of this page, they have something called interest cards. So interest cards is um, the area, you pick the area where you're interested in working. If it's accounting or it's engineering or it's biology. So let's do engineering since he's um, interested in engineering. And you can hit submit and then what happens is it's going to post all of the job specs now the job spec is what the type of job is so you can go through this is the best thing um, i tell people to do is go through each of these jobs see which ones you're qualified for and i'll explain how to look at how you determine if you're qualified for the job and um you can create an interest card so you will be emailed or texted every time that particular job opens up on the website. So you don't have to keep checking. So that way you're going to get an interest card that says, oh, the civil engineer job is open today. It's at this location. You can click on it and go in and immediately apply for it. So that's an easy way to um, keep track of jobs that you're interested in and your narrow field where you're, what you're of interest for. And that way it's across all the agencies, you'll get notified wherever. Um, you can go back up to the top a little if you don't mind. You're going to want to create an account with the state of Connecticut. So you're going to see there's a new user registration. You're going to go in and create a user ID and a password. And uh, you'll follow, I'm a new, um, it's, there should be, Ask your application. Why? No, go down. It's really small. Um, be, fill all the application now. Go ahead and click apply online, and maybe it brings you to the account. So there's a lot of the terms of um, and of usage of the the um, application, and I would definitely read all of those. And if you're in, you're going to have to agree to the, the areas in the box, the terms of use that you'll do. And if you're a new user, you just click on it, fill out all this information. 
The master application is the place where you type in your resume per se, all of your work experience, your degrees, what jobs you've had, and you can save that. So you create it one time and save it. If you ever have to update it, you have a second job. You're no longer at that job. You're at this next job. You're going to update that on there. When you go to apply for the job that you're interested in, you just copy your master application into the job. It takes all that history that you set up in the beginning, all set and done, into that application. You'll answer a few questions based on the job, and then you'll hit submit. And then off you are very easily applying for that job. I noticed one of the questions that you guys asked, so I'm going to kind of jump in while I'm thinking of it, is how long does it take to get a state job? It took me nine months to get into the state. So typical job recruitments can take up to at least six months to fill. So I want to give you the heads up that do not be discouraged. Um, I had probably 12 interviews with the state at 12 different agencies, and one of them finally clicked. So do not be discouraged. Um, the state is a large employer. Um, you never know what opportunity that you've gone to that maybe someone's going to say, hey, you know what, she's got this particular background. They may tell you, you know what, you might be better at this agency. This really would fit your needs. They may talk to their counterpart in HR to say, hey, look out for this one if they ever apply. They seem to be a good fit. So it's always good to network and try for everything and anything because you never know what's going to come out of that. So, I, and I never want you to discourage, be discouraged about getting a job in the state of Connecticut because it, it will take time. Um, if you do luckily get one, I, I don't honestly know a lot of my counterparts who have gotten a job real quick. Um, so it, just, just know that, don't be discouraged. Um, Even though a lot of people have retired recently because of, you know, new, uh, new, yeah, new, all the new opportunities that we have, um, you need to remember that when you apply for the jobs, the ones from the outside of the public, if it's a very specified industry, like only people who have engineering degrees and whatever, that's a smaller group than people who are maybe secretaries or clerical. So in an engineering recruitment, you may only get 40 or 50 applications. In a clerical recruitment, which I used to do, I would receive a thousand applications, every recruitment that was open. So there's a you're you're against a thousand people. A lot of people want to get into the state because of the benefits that we have, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So that's why I say don't give up, keep applying, keep look doing it, going for interviews if you get picked, follow the recruitment process, just just keep stabbing at it. So um, there are a lot of people looking for jobs, and yes, we do have quite a few state job openings, but. Uh, there's a lot of competition out there because everybody does want to get into the state. So. And the other thing, Millie, is the fact that so many people have retired make it complicated in getting doing the whole search process. So it's a lengthy search process now because now we have a lot of new hires who have stepped up to do the recruiting parts. Um, like, for instance, at the university. There's a part where HR posts the job and we get that posted, but then there's a search committee that actually looks at all the adjuncts or the um, applications. applications that are applying for a full-time position. And that has to be looked at by the committee. Do they all qualify? Then we have to interview them. We have to go from there. So it's, it's, a, it's six months minimum is to fill the job. So no news is good news. Um, and I can tell you with, with the system that the state has put into place, um, I know a lot of you might get taught to constantly follow up and see where your application is. The way the state has set this up, there's really no one to email for the job unless your job posting specifically has someone's name and phone number on it. A lot of the executive branch jobs, there's a recruitment unit that takes all the applications, determined who's the minimally qualified, and then they send them out to the agencies. And then it's up to the agencies to handle the recruitment. So the person who did the posting and got everybody who's minimally qualified for the job knows no has no idea how far they are in the recruitment process if they've started interviews. So the process is a little bit different now that most of this is all automated than back in you know years ago where you would kind of always do the follow up phone call and you know whatever. The follow up happens when you do an interview. So when you do an interview, you're going to want to email and thank the people who interviewed you and reach out and touch base then. But in the very beginning, there's not a lot of 
interaction until you get to the step where they reach out to you. So that's one of the nuances that has changed over time. Um, someone like though, if you're going for um, a professor position and you want to be in education, the professors are actually looking at the search committee is the professors. So you may be able to email them and check where your, their status is on the position. So it all depends on the type of position you go for. So to go back to the main page, the other big tip that I can give you is make sure you read. Go back to the job openings page. <clears throat> So right here in the beginning in the front, it says check out the applicant tips on how to apply. They're going to give you there a whole bunch of tips of what they want to see um, in your master application. So what you can watch this little short video or it may be a PDF and go through and make sure you read the points of what they're looking for. So that you prepare, you put a job opening in, you apply and you get hired. Um, get organized, what materials do you need, and get, get everything ready for you to input your master application. Have all of that ready to go so you're not sitting there for five hours creating a master app. You've kind of got your resume and you can create everything. So follow all the guides that they say to do um, to, to register. One of the other things that they have is um, at the bottom of that on job openings, they mentioned about the state of Connecticut's LinkedIn page. It's in that gray box at the very top um, at the you know, under the video. So you can watch that video about how you can um, work at the state of Connecticut and make make an impact in the state governance. You can um, go to the state's LinkedIn page and start following the state's LinkedIn page. If you have an account there, that is another big way the state of Connecticut is now pushing for hiring. They post all the jobs out that way. So if you follow LinkedIn, that is another um, way that the state um, hires. So definitely want to follow their page there. Um, if you don't have a LinkedIn account and you need to know how to get started, there's information on how to create a LinkedIn account right there for you. And they have something called an EVP, which means Employer Value Proposition. And that is what the state of Connecticut um, explains like why you want to work for the state, what we can do for you. You're committed to making an impact to government, you know, social work, any, anything that you're helping the state of Connecticut employees provide a service. DMV, you're helping them with their your cars. You're, um, we want diversity and fresh perspective. Now that we have a lot of retirees, we're really looking for, to get in a room, a whole new group of people to learn the state business to work here for another 20 or 30 years. So You'll, you'll, you know, that's one of the things we like to do. And the state of Connecticut does offer a lot of beginner programs for graduates to go through training. One of them, you know, the first job I noticed that you picked up was called accounting careers training. So if you want to be an accountant, you can come in as an accounting careers trainee with your bachelor degree, and then the state will actually train you for one to two years based on your program, and then you will be at the minimum level of the first step in a job series for the accountant. And then as you work more and you have more years of service, you can move up to the second level and the third level. So accounting careers trainee is one of the big ways to get into the state, especially for kids who just, you know, not kids, you guys aren't kids anymore, who just graduated from college. We get a lot of those jobs get filled a lot. And that, of course, there's a lot of competition for everybody who graduates at the same time. So um, that is the best way to get in. And I know a ton of employees who worked th their way through um, the state this way. And there's even an engineering program. I know at the uh, Department of Motor Vehicle, there's an engineering one to, to begin. Um, so there's a lot. Um, education, though, you do need to get all your criteria set first with your schooling and then um, student teaching and so forth. And you work, work in through that way. Um, let's see. They're also on this, the main page. It does mention that besides LinkedIn, there is a Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram account for the state of Connecticut that you can follow. The icons are on the maybe at the top right. Yeah, they're very small, but you could find their pages there and start following them. So that's the main area. So everybody, let's make sure page. that we have a link to this for the Insta Instagram page. Yeah. So that we the, this page or their Instagram our page? Instagram links to that Instagram. Okay. Yeah. And follow it or 
that we followed this yep. page. Yep. And you can certainly share things there on the page, you know, and you could share your things on their page. So to get more exposure for whatever you're doing. And there are, are a lot. I know the state police follows the Instagram. They always post when they're hiring for state troopers. Um, DOC follows that page and they'll put announcements up there when they're doing correction officer recruitments. So following all of these. Um, it is, is a really good way to start seeing and even looking now to see what kind of jobs you may want to aspire to those who are sophomores and juniors looking at those to see what kind of things you need what account what degrees they're actually looking for um, and that can kind of help you shape where you go so um basically i told you about creating an application and uh, the big time saver is getting interest cards so you get alerted when the job of your um desire gets posted and another tip, the tip that I can give you for when you apply, um, the one thing I, as a recruiter that have seen many applications, make sure, make sure, make sure you follow the directions. I cannot tell you how many people do not follow directions of an application and it will get tossed right off the bat. That's your first test, is can you complete an application the way that they say it? If they ask you to attach a resume, make sure you attach a resume. If they want your transcripts, Make sure you attach your transcripts. Um, make sure your spelling is correct. Do a spell check. Always check your spelling. If you are going for a clerical job and you don't spell correctly, you're never going to, you're just, anything. You're, you're done. Anything. Anything. anything, anything, any job, anything. Any, anything. I can't tell you what a disappointment it is when you look at the applications and you see how they're not filled out. There is a spot on the application that says, what are your work duties? Just don't say, I do cashiering. That's not telling us much. I interact with the public. I um, keep tabs of my, um, I budget my register till. You know, get into more details of what you actually do. Um, because when employers use this kind of recruitment process, and we have 1,000 applications to go through, there is a search for us to be able to say, I am looking for someone who has, um, I'm not even sure, an MBA. So we can take all those 1,000 and search, search for the keyword in your application that says MBA, and only you now are in the pool to move on. So that's kind of how this electronic recruitment works. So make sure you put all the key buzzwords in your description of what you do. Do not say, see resume. Do not put in what your job duties are, see resume. You're not gonna go anywhere. Make sure you fill everything out the way that they say. That is the biggest, um, the biggest thing that will not make you go further in the job. And it's the most simplest thing, following directions and making sure your spelling is correct. Um, and I also will say with this particular program, and do you know I, think that, I would say punctuation to yes. Yeah, periods. Um, I know all letters. I can tell you what I see is on your resume, you may have bullets like this, this, and this. Absolutely fine. When you copy that part of the resume and you put it into the application, it is gonna look like this. Don't leave it like that. Put a period between each thing because you're not going to be able to make it look as pretty as a resume in this. It's just a paragraph that they want to know about your work duties. So make sure you change that into sentence structure. So just don't copy and paste. Um, you're making a first. Uh, you're making a first, first impression, impression, and that first impression has to be positive. Yeah. yeah, because the people are looking at your app first. They're not meeting you first. They're looking at this. And the other big thing is when it comes to applying, do not wait for the last hour to apply. Um, you know, you may have your master application all set and you may have it ready, but I am going to tell you that I have found a couple of times that I went to go apply for the job because I knew when my, I put it in my tickler, oh, apply for by November 25th. And I go at November 24th at the end of the day to go do it. The job's not listed anymore. There are possibilities where the job may get taken down because if you have 1,000 applications, we can't, we don't need two, another 2,000 more to go through. So the job may get taken down a little bit early. So make sure if it's something you're really desperate and, and want to get into and want to be part of, apply right away. Make sure, give yourself time. Don't even submit the application on your first submission. 
wait the next day, go back and look at it a second time. You never, you're never, you're never going to know what you might have missed when you thought it was perfect the day before. So that's kind of a, a tip from what I, what I can give you. And then to talk a little bit about, am I qualified for this position? So on these um, sheets that I've given you, the top position that says, am I qualified? I've pulled a couple of job specs for you to look at. And the state does it with minimum qualifications and special requirements. And sometimes they have what's called preferred qualifications. So for a social worker trainee job, you need a bachelor's or master's degree in social work or a very closely related field. They quote, then they tell you exactly what a closely related field is. It's considered sociology, child development, child welfare, clinical psychology, counseling, human development, family studies, human service, marriage and family. They give you a whole list. So if your degree is in that and you have a bachelor's, you have met the general experience so you can apply. The special requirements are a list of other things that you may need to have. For instance, you may need to have a motors vehicle vehicle uh, license. If you're Department of Child and Family Services, you can be called out at any time to go to a home. You need to be able to drive and get there. So there are some special requirements for the job. As long as you meet all of those, you're eligible to apply. Um, if you don't have that degree, let's say this is March and you don't have your bachelor's degree yet, um, you really cannot apply because they um, look at it at the time of application. So if a job shows up in March and you don't have your bachelor's yet, even though I know recruitment takes six months, you didn't have your bachelor's when the job closed March 31st. So you're not technically qualified at the time of application. So just so you know that, that, that you kind of have to wait till you have that bachelor's in your hands. I took a financial worker, um, worker position, the minimum qualifications, two years of clerical experience in accounting, record keeping, uh, financial record keeping or bookkeeping. So if you had um, you know, any type of experience, I know there isn't a lot of clerical work per se out there anymore that, that kind of is going away, but if you have worked at a hair salon and you've done the books and you've taken payment and you've balanced the books or you balanced your cash register till, Turn that into something because that's that is what the clerical bookkeeping or accounting or record keeping is. So um, you also have an ability for substitutions, which is nice. College training may be substituted for general experience on the base of 15 semester hours equaling half a year of experience. So if you've already have 15 credit hours, you can already count a half year experience and you only have had to work one and a half years now and the other six months is made up of your half year college. So you could that's how to read that type of qualification. Um, the next one I pulled is another type of social worker. I think the first one was a trainee. Yeah, it was a training, which it shows you minimal class to get in, kind of learn the job, and then you'll be promoted up to social worker. So if you wanted to be an ultimately a social worker, you need the master's degree in social work or closely, closely related field and one year of experience in the self-directed use of case management techniques and counseling to sustain or restore client functioning or a bachelor's degree in social work or a closely related field and two years of experience. So you have to see how what your education and your work experience matches up. So you can have a bachelor's without the master's, but you need more years of work experience behind your belt. Um, they also list the closely related fields. They list any substitutions. So right here it says that for state employees that have completed their social worker trainee program, they may substitute that for the general experience. So if you've been a social worker training, a posting comes up, you've done your, your uh, time as the trainee, social worker comes up, you can now apply for that. Even if you don't have the, the master's degree or whatever, you can seek that on your own time if you want to go through it. Otherwise, right here, it shows you it's not required as long as you have the minimum of the training. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is preferred qualifications. That's an additional um, add on the postings that you'll see that a lot of people are doing now because of the fact that we get so many applications per job. So we're going to be, that's where we kind of search when we have, all right, we've now narrowed 1,000 down to 500 people. So now I know in this particular preferred qualification, I'm looking for someone who's had work with Excel. 
I'm looking for someone with verbal or written communication, multiple, someone who does a lot of assignments with deadlines and someone who has um, speaking and interacting with business owners, members of the public or various other stakeholders. One of the easiest um, qualifications we can search on your application is Excel. So that's why I say when you write what your job duties are, make sure you include that in there. I know resumes basically stay, um, you know, your um, experience with uh, Microsoft Office products, whatever, but your resume isn't what is searched on. It's the um, job duties that you type in. So if your job is to do PowerSoft, Microsoft Office, make sure you include what Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, because we'll then search those applications and narrow the 500 people down to 250 because they meet our preferred qualification. If you don't meet the preferred qualifications, can you still apply? Yes, you can. Not everybody may have the preferred qualifications. You're in the same um, applicant pool as everybody else. So you never know who's applying and how many applicants there are. So don't be discouraged and say, oh, they're not going to interview me because I don't have Excel. You, you may, they may have, nobody may have Excel that applied for this. So it's just a way for us to dwindle down our list to kind of help us with recruiting to, to get the person who's most qualified for the position. That's what we're always looking for, whoever has the most qualifications. And on the back, I think um, the very last page, I gave you a list of showing you the job, the various um, accounting careers trainee jobs that I talked about, uh, Connecticut career trainees. These are all of the ones where you could start right out after college without any work experience. So those may be ones. And, you, you know, all you need to do is go back to that search criteria on the um, page and type in trainee for the job class. And you're going to see a lot more than this came up. I only gave you the A and C. There's A to Z with training. So if any of those um, are something of interest, you would definitely want to do an interest card. And you can start doing an interest card now, you know, just to see it and get it and check out what it is and start creating your application now to have it ready when the time comes for graduation. When you have some spare time, definitely get that all set up. And I just didn't go through the other branches of government, but if those um, areas do interest you, they have the exact same setup in there. It's judicial branch, on when you click on their website, they have their own program. So you'd have to get set up in there if you're looking to work in the court area. If you're looking to work in the government, you follow the legislative branch website and their um, website to hire. And the state colleges and universities, unfortunately, you we all have our own central has its own western has its own eastern has its own but this is the main area to go to to kind of surf what's open and that one you may have to because they don't have interest cards on that particular job so at least you don't have to surf all four places you can just surf one or two of wherever your main interest is so that's basically how to get a job in the state of connecticut those are the four main areas where you can look to find a job and then after that, it's all up to you. Do you guys have any questions? The master application, right? Yeah. Is it like you have a profile, you have the application, and then you can be like, I want to do this job. Click and send my application there, or would I have to individually fill out? applications each and every time I apply for a different job. Nope. You're going to fill out the application once and then when a job opening comes available, you're going to click on apply for that job and you're going to say, it's going to say, are you a new register or, or, or current register? You're current because you already have your account. You're going to log in and then there's going to be an opportunity that says copy my master application. You copy your master application. It goes right to that job you're interested in. There's a couple more questions that you have to answer. You go just follow the tabs, make sure everything looks good, and then you hit submit. So you don't have to keep typing that every time. Yes, that is a big time saver. So can you update though? Because sometimes you might mm -hmm. need to emphasize something in your resume that you didn't emphasize because of the specific job mm -hmm. you're. That's why they give for. you the chance. You copy your master app into there. 
and then go read through it. If this one is definitely telling you I want Excel and that isn't something you have in your master app, make sure you add those key buzzwords in at the job duties. This is my job duties. This is my job duties. So you can tweak that master application to every job that you are applying for. So because you go to the job and then you sort of get the the, the original job description and, and it pastes it or yeah. So um all right, let me let me still I'll start to uh, apply for a job. You get me back to the main page. Okay. Let how about let's apply for one of the career trainings. Sure. I think that we're counting careers trainees. Okay. Are you sharing the screen? Yeah. 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 Um, it's it's got the box right in. Do I need to just Ooh. okay? So here's the Connecticut careers trainee. You just got the alert that you're going to be a, a revenue examiner. So you, you like that area. You're going to click. You're going to first you're going to do is read through this. This kind of tells you about. Um, sorry, I don't have my distance glasses, but it tells you a little bit about the position, um, what you're going to be doing, the minimum requirements that you need. And because this is a trainee job, it shows um, if you have bachelors with 15 semesters hours in accounting, you're going to start at this rate then this rate as you keep getting more and more experience about the state of Connecticut. This is going to explain why work for the state of Connecticut, what we can offer. This is the Department of Labor. When you go to this website, it shows you all about the Department of Labor. If you're going to get interviewed for that job, make sure you read the Department of Labor's website, what their mission statement is, what their what their goals are. Make sure you know a little bit about the Department of Labor when you go to interview. This also tells you what kind of benefits we offer you, comprehensive benefits, including um, a good salary structure, health and dental retirement, work-life balance, um, diversity, fresh perspectives. That's one of the things now that, you know, we want to get a lot of new people in. Uh, the, a video to watch. Sometimes they're specific. If you're going to be a correction officer, they actually have a video showing you what the correction officer is required to do. Make sure you you can do this physical work before you apply for it. And make uh, sure you want to work inside a prison. prison. Exactly. State police will also show you all the tests that they need to go through for state police. So the, these videos are geared toward the particular job. I know there's a healthcare video out there about nursing. So depending on the job, it has it. It tells you how to apply important information after you apply and that's basically talks to you about that process that takes part um, connect with us now this is the person at um, DAS that you can contact about your application but they're not going to know much because this has actually been sent off to the Department of Labor once everybody applies so that's where I say you might not have follow-up with with someone because we have a recruiting unit that make sure everybody's um, uh, uh, minimally qualified and then off they go. So it tells you all about the duties that you're going to do, your minimum qualifications. OK, possession of a bachelor's degree in a closely related field. And then these are the preferred qualifications right. that they're looking for. So I am going to hit apply online. And then tells you the um, information, the application instructions for the accounting careers trainee. This tells you everything about what they expect on the applications and your responsibilities as an applicant. Make sure you provide valid email address. They only contact you through email. Um, make sure you follow all of these that they tell you and you agree with it. And then um, I'm already a registered person. So I'm going to apply for this job. Don't laugh at my email. Um, oh, let's see, I guess that is it. I have not applied for a job in a long time because I'm so happy. Um, let's see. And I would say, though, speaking of Kathy's, you know, my goofy email, don't put in a goofy email. Exactly. Don't have a goofy message on your phone answering machine. Use something that looks professional because I know lots of employers that if they see something that is not professional, they will not invite you for an interview, period. They exactly. And she, that is 100% correct. I'm not going to tell you how many explicit emails I've seen in the um, line of what their email address is. Um, Goofy was something I created when I was 18 years old, way back when, and I've never changed it. But um, yeah, and that's fine if it's a personal email, but don't use it for work. Don't use, and um, yeah. Don't have a funky 
voicemail message. And you can use your school email as your yep. professional email. 100%. Yep. Yeah. You'll see us. Up to like two years after you graduate, and then they encourage you to either make another one of like another personal email that you have dedicated. Not not to say like first name dot last name at that, you can use that or something. Something basic, else. But, but yeah. you know. But the, the years ago, the assistant principal, I think in Newington, of Newington High School was very clear. Oh, I pick up the phone, I call someone, I get a um, an inappropriate voicemail message. I don't leave a message. I hang up. I never call them back. And I can tell you this. This is one thing as a recruiter that I could not stand. I call, I leave you a voicemail. You call right back two minutes later and say, you called me from this number? Yes, this is Kathy from Human Resources. Who's this? I didn't check. Did you message. did you listen to my voicemail? No. I cannot tell you how many people do that. Listen to your voicemail. Be prepared and call back when you are in the right frame line. Don't just go, "Hey, you called me from this number." I'm a receptionist at my other job, and like the other employees will like call. Um, like family members, whatever, and then they call me back because you know I'm the receptionist, and then they're like, "You called," and I was like, "I didn't call." Maybe well, I don't say it like that. Yeah. But you know, someone else in the facility called. Like, did you check your message? And it's just like, exactly. what I'm gonna do about it. That's not too fair. Of course, so. I figure it out. But I'm just yeah. saying. Exactly. But yeah, it's you know. You no, know, but it's one of the reasons why we have scripts. We have ways that people because one of the things we're trying to train everyone or teach everyone how to do is work in a professional office. So that when you have to run one, you know what they run like. And when you go to apply for a job, you've had practice because it's always easier to do things that you've practiced mm -hmm. than if you have not Yeah. And because I'm a pain in the neck. There still is, you know, a lot of old school out there when it comes to professionalism. I know a lot of it is has changed over the time, different generations, but um, you know, still we're we're it's a professional work environment. Um, you know, you don't want to ever type like you text. A lot of people that have like horrible um, content in their like media, social media. Shut it down. Get rid so of those. The public mm -hmm. can't see it. Hundred percent. Your employer is going to go check every social media account you've ever had. They're going to do a background check on you. You know, that's just part of the process. So, um, yep, make sure you don't put anything if inappropriate. Anything on having to do with working with children, there'll be a criminal background check. If you have to, if you're working with money, there'll be a credit check. If you're, um, uh, if, if you need to be licensed, they'll check your sure driver's you license and your insurance records to make sure that, um, there aren't any DUIs or, you know, lots of speeding tickets that, that, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, be prepared. No. We're, we're not allowed to look at anybody's social media or anything like that when we're evaluating applications, but the university will check it. Right. If you become one of the top three candidates that's selected for the job, that's when HR does their deep dive. So it could move you from, if you were first place and you've got um, inappropriate items, you've just dropped down and now two or three may be the and next And it's choices. not that you can't have fun, but there are ways to shut down your Facebook or your Instagram or your Twitter accounts, right? It's one of the reasons why Instagram is so popular because stuff disappears as opposed to Facebook where it stays there for like ever and it reminds you 10 years later, like, you know, Snapchat. <laughs> Yeah, or Snapchat, Snapchat the other reason, right. Um, but um, in addition to that, I guess um, it's always, it's difficult to be too formal. Somebody can always tell you to lighten up, right, if you're being too formal. But if you're being too informal, then it's difficult to tell you to, like, straighten up and fly right. But people can tell you, you no, know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to dress in a business suit every day. You don't have to, right? You don't have to wear right. 
makeup or a dress or, right. or, or whatever. Yeah. Many times I've interviewed candidates and, you know, dress for success right off the bat, come in with a great impression. Um, maybe you're even doing a custodian job. It doesn't matter. Dress up nice. I, khakis, a dress shirt, tie. You don't have to have a jacket. That's not kind of a, a, a employment that, you know, you would expect them to wear a suit every day, but look presentable. Um, and then when you come in for the interview, I, I, I've interviewed a ton of people. You can tell when they're so nervous and, and you know, they're just not breathing well. I, I always will say to them exactly what she said. Let's take a deep breath. Let's just relax. Let's remember this is a general conversation for us to get to learn a little bit about you. And then it usually will flow. But if you come in and you sit down and you're in ripped jeans, sneakers, not tied, pants to the ground, and you come in and you do this and you're chomping your gum at me, I'm not going to tell you to straighten up. You're going to leave the interview and you're not going to be considered. So um, just be mindful of that kind of stuff. So, and then they'll always tell you, oh, we do casual Friday. You know, if you get the job, then you're going to learn about the dress code and everything, but always shoot for, shoot for success do a good impression. I remember years ago in the history department when we were interviewing candidates for the professional program. Mm -hmm. One came in in shorts and a button down shirt um, with sneakers on and sat like this over the chair and was like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. For the whole, and the other faculty member and I were like, mm -hmm. what? How are we supposed to send them? Like, what's going to happen? Right. I don't know where. I, 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 as far as I know, he's teaching somewhere now. But um, I think, but it was twenty years ago. So, um, he could be doing something else. But. but back to your question, I just clicked on applying for that job, and see how it says right up there, copy my application. So I'm going to copy my master application that I have. You click on it and what it's going to do, it will copy what I have in that master app and it's going to move it into the status of applying for that job. And then that's where you tweak it and then submit it. I'm not going to apply because I don't want anybody to think I'm going for careers training. But, but that's just, I mean, it's that simple. It's, it, it, once you get in there and play around, you're going to know exactly what you're doing. So. This. So, any other questions that you have? So, you asked about the application process. Um, so, Kat, you've worked for the state of Connecticut for a long time, Kat. How many different agencies have you worked for? This is my third agency. I started out at the Department of Administrative Services, and my job was actually to create the Online Employment Center. <laughs> And I brought that into the state of Connecticut because back in the day, they were doing 14 page paper hand applications. So the hand applications, we would get a ton of mail and you would have to hand write every application for every job you wanted to apply. Yeah. So the state got automated and I was brought in and I was on the team to help create this and bring that. So I kind of know this. This this part of the application. So you know the inside and the outside, which I just gave you all my tips. You guys have heard all my tips in the last 45. So if you paid attention, you knew everything that I would say that's going to get you to move further along. Read the job description and make sure you, you know, you're... don't apply for something you're not eligible for. You're wasting everybody's time and your time, and it's just it's not you know make go for the jobs that will make sense for you because. You, I can tell you, I can know a name when I used to be in that unit. I would know a name over a frequent flyer who applied for every job in the state of Connecticut. You're not qualified for every job in the state of Connecticut. What's the what do you what's the point? So, you know, then you don't want to be known as that either, like always applying for things that you're not actually eligible for. So I started out in DAS doing the recruitments and the exams, and then we created this online process and things got much simpler for everybody. And then after that, I actually left and went to the Department of Correction and I became a recruiter. So I wanted to actually use this application to see how well it was gonna work for our needs. And I had a blast working at the Department of Correction. I was not in a prison. I was in the main office, so working in HR, um, getting to know the people. I hired all the maintenance. I hired the correction officers. I hired the priests. We have priests that are in the Department of Correction. So there's just about any and every kind of job out there in, for the state of Connecticut. So. Um, and then after working there for a while, I decided to come try my hand at CCSU. So I've been here for about a year and a half now, recruiting and um, 
doing a lot of just more general HR stuff. So I do a little bit of recruiting here, but not as much as I did. So. So I do see you have a couple questions. I'll do them real quick because it's a little after one and I know you guys probably have to go to your two, but there's some of your questions are really great. What are the benefits of having a job with the state? The biggest one is stability and retirement and health benefits. That's the absolute biggest one. You are going to have stability with here. You are going to have many opportunities to grow, and there are many agencies. Your, your state service carries with you wherever you go. So maybe you feel you've conquered Department of Children and Families, you know, after 20 years of working there, and you kind of want to go try the Department of Public Health and work in that aspect. You can transfer and move over there. And the more broad knowledge you get of how the state of Connecticut works, the better it is for you. And, and also helping you find what your true niche is if you're not 100% positive. So um, there's just a lot of opportunity with the state. What's the difference between state and public employment? Um, I used to work for public employment. Um, so the basic differences um, are with the state, you have a lot of um, rules and regulations that are set up. If you're in a union, you have union contracts. You mean private employment? Oh, private employment, sorry. Sorry, because the state, state public state employment public, is public, public employment. employment. Right. I knew exactly what you meant, you but private, I read it yeah. the wrong. Private employment. Um, so basically there's a lot of rules and regulations and union contracts and things that you follow and working for the state, it's negotiated because there's, 20,000 employees under the state where it's very big. Everybody, all these agencies report to one one employer. We're all state of Connecticut. Where a private industry, you just have the people that work with you at that particular company, smaller group. You may not have unions. There may be um, different rules. Uh, I know with state, you know, we budget for your union contract says you're going to get this much in percentage of raise every year. So you know what to expect. Whereas in private, there's no um, rules and it could be based on whatever was they want. That's right. Exactly what I'm saying is company can decide, right, you're there for six months to a year, they can then decide, all right, you can be best employees first year. They can still overlook you for a raise due to personal bias. And you can't really, it's hard to, dis, uh, to dispute that, let's say, law. they don't like you. Right. Oh, like no, it's you. very, They're very difficult. hard to complain. Right, or they may pay you more money up front, but they don't contribute to a retirement plan and, and they don't contribute to health benefits in the same way. Right. So to some degree, and they're much less flexible. So to some degree, you have to balance um, money up front with health insurance and um, with health and dental insurance and the retirement plans and and think about things, um, think about that things that way. I mean, working for the state can also be a pain, right? Because um, there are so many rules and restrictions in the way things go. So Well, they're used to me going, you know, one of these days we may get audited and I have to be able to say what we were all doing. Right. Yeah, you maybe not have heard me say that kind of stuff to you yet at your mind. But I have been known to say, what, Dr. Mahoney, why do we have to log into Blackboard? Well, because if anybody asks me where everybody was and what they were doing, I need some backup in addition to Core CT to be able to say, this is, yeah. yeah. And why do we have a job description? And why? Well, because, you know. Yeah, because this is what we expect of you. We lay it all out where there might be not job descriptions in the private industry. Well, they, one of the, where the wait, remember when we were looking for the accounting, like financial examiner trainee yeah. person? What that person does is go to different agencies and see how they're spending the money. And if you're not spending the money according to the rules, they expect it back. Or you get a black mark. And I'm fairly determined that, that that black mark is not going to come at us. Yeah. So we're audited too. You know, I have the same thing with uh, there's something called dual employment. If you work at two agencies, there's a form that you have to fill oh, out. God, it's hideous. It, so. And it doesn't work for the universities. It does not work for you. So, so no, no. Here, we could bring in a speaker from Yale, pay them a thousand dollars. Nobody's going to bat an eye. Hire a professor from UConn or Eastern, 
we have to do a dual employment form. And unless we put the talk out to bid, but let's say I want someone to come and speak on Latino politics in the United States as seen in the 2021, 2022 midterm elections. There's like five people in the country capable of doing it. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, unless I put the talk like we have here all the time out to bid, I can only pay them $99. And the paper, and we still have to do the dual employment for, to make sure that they're not like double uh, it, double dipping. Uh, Auditors come in and make sure they're not double dipping, and you know, uh, it's it's so uh, we get audited and, on and all those a forms. year ago. What did we remember with the with the conference? We were getting questions. Why are the honoraria different? Well, because this one's coming for two days. And that one's only coming for one because this one's a big famous like about to retire person and this person just got their phd so like there and because a lot of questions because this is um the state and the money comes from taxpayers so a lot of people will say you will hear those people say i pay your salary yeah so and they want to make sure you're doing right by the money that we send into the state taxpayers assume this is one of the problems I think with state employment or even municipal employment. So K through 12 teaching is through towns and cities, not through the state, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that so many people are distrustful of state employees. They think we are all those guys who stand on the highway and look down manhole covers, I think, yeah. Yeah, no, seriously, because when you say, I, I said to somebody once, well, I'm a state worker, and I said, no, you're not, you're a college professor. Like, I work for the state of Connecticut. Oh, so it's always that person at DMV who gives you bad yes. service, or like the DOT person who's staring down the manhole cover thing or whatever. Right. So there's this assumption right. that, that State state workers are lazy and yeah. that they um which I have to say is um uh is not fun. For but, internships, can I ask you something like the um the state job page for internship or is it some you and some no? Um no, usually internships are paid for. They're not paid for. No, they're not paid for. Anybody missing a button? And it looks oh, like I didn't answer the rest of the questions that you guys came up with. So thank you. Thank so you. Um, welcome. Do state our state internships have those up? Um no, they're not. Do you have to go through the agencies to find those internships, or is it through a third party? Um, you have to go to the agencies. I do know that at DOC, there was someone in charge of um internships to to learn at DOC, and there it was on their website. So that is something that's coordinated by each agency if they do that or not, and you kind of do have to dig for those. So and, they're not posted. And the other thing is lots of departments here have internship classes. So right. your connections through here so, to the college, to the employers. So or political good. science, for example, has, has internships in the legislature, but you have to have X number of credits in political science to do that. Um, International Studies has an internship program. History Department has an internship program. Student teaching is really an internship. You know, so there are lots of, and the Handshake Program, Leilani has um, internships listed in. Yeah, most of those are through your, your college connections and their. Because yeah. they're, they're, you get college credit instead of. Mm -hmm. hey. Sign. This is a little bit from us to you. Oh, wow. Look at my names on there. Mm How -hmm. impressive. And we all signed it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll post Thank it you in my office. Looking if you ever have any HR questions or you want to come talk to me, feel free to. I'm happy to talk, give you advice. Well. You're welcome. In Davidson, right? I wish I'm in Davidson Hall. Yep, second floor. So just send me an email. You've got my K DeBoer at CCSU. Mm -hmm. It's not too hard. And um, I wish you guys all luck with getting through your schooling and finding your dream job.